Thank you. Welcome to Congregation Yeshua Tzion. Let's open in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy and for your holy days. We thank you for Purim, Lord. Hallelujah. Ruchata Adonai Ha'el HaKadosh Praised are you, Adonai, holy God. Ruchata Adonai Mikabetz Nidchei Amo Yisrael Praised are you, Adonai, who gathers the dispersed of his people, Yisrael. Ruchata Adonai Loheinu Melech Olam Praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, for granting us life, for sustaining us, and for helping us to reach this day. Hallelujah. Praise Adonai, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. Praise the God of gods, for his loving kindness endures forever. Praise the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness endures forever. Who alone did great wonders, for his loving kindness endures forever. Who made the heavens by wisdom, for his loving kindness endures forever. Who spread the earth on the waters, for his loving kindness endures forever. Praise the God of heaven, for his loving kindness endures forever. Thank you for Shabbat, Lord. We pray you'd quiet our hearts that we might enter into worship today. We thank you for this wonderful day to remember your deliverance of your people. Shame Yeshua HaMashiach. This week's Torah portion is called Vayikra, which is the first portion of the book of Leviticus and spans from chapters 1 through 5. The word Vayikra means, and he called, since that is the first word of the portion, beginning with God calling to Moses and telling him to speak to the children of Israel and instruct them how they are to give their sin offerings. This entire portion consists of God's instructions on how to give offerings to him. All the offerings are to be without defect and uh, brought to the tent of meeting to be sacrificed. It's done typically with an animal like a sheep or a bull or a goat. Turtle doves or pigeons are used or grains or flowers. That, uh, they're all brought to the priest and typically slaughtered and burned on the altar according exactly to God's instruction on how to do it. Each time the priests burn it, it says that the burnt offering is like a soothing aroma to Adonai. Besides animals, offerings can also be made with the grains or the flour. Oil and frankincense are often poured on it in the same way it is to be without any defects and burned on the altar by the priest according to God's instructions, and it is again a soothing aroma to him. It is also mentioned that the grain offerings are done with salt and that they must have no chametz in them. No leavened bread is to be used for offerings, which could be a way of showing the purity of the grain. Uh, the grain offering, which must also have no defects and must be without blemish, just like the animal offerings are. An offering can be made as a fellowship offering. The process, the process differentiates based on what animal is being sacrificed, or what degree of sin, what degree of sacrifice is necessary. There are also offerings to atone for both unintentional and intentional sins. The processes are slightly different, but a distinct difference is made 
between the two different types of sins. The unintentional is simply when somebody breaks any of God's mitzvot and they recognize it and have to come before God to atone for it. An intentional sin has a higher emphasis on a guilt of an individual, which comes from the soul, it is a much bigger deal, and not only does a person have to bring an animal as an offering, but they bring themselves and their guilt before God to ask for forgiveness. There are also sins committed against one's neighbor which can be atoned for where rams can be used as offerings as well. All of these offerings are to be done according to God's instruction, but are always ultimately intended to come from one's heart. Although there are all physical ways to atone for sins, it is not, always, it is not at all limited to the physical sacrifice. That is why this passage puts a hem- heavy emphasis on how all the sacrifices must be given without defects and must be from the best of the animals or the best of the grains a person owns. This way, it is truly a sacrifice that makes atonement before God a priority over a desire that one might have to keep those animals or grains for themselves. Because of the sacrifice, God will reward a person not only with atonement for sins, but also with a replacement for the given items because of their uh, faith to give those to God. It takes a lot of faith for a person to give their best thing as a sacrifice to God, but God always blesses them in return when they do. In the same way, we today don't necessarily have to give our best animals or grains before God to be burned, but we can give money in the form of tithe, or we can give our best time to worship Him. God returns us with an abundance of what we need when we put our trust in Him. Though the sacrifices are different today, the same concept of faith in God as we humble ourselves, bringing our sins before God, still applies regardless. No sacrifice is complete without a true desire to receive atonement from God, regardless of what it is. This reminds me of way back before this with the story of Cain and Abel, which of course happens at the beginning of Genesis. When Cain offered his sacrifice of the fruit of the ground which he had uh, harvested, it was not accepted by God as it was not done in faith. It was not necessarily the best of his stock, and he did not trust God would necessarily provide more for him, so he just gave whatever he had. Abel's sacrifice, however, was the firstlings of his, st- of his flock, which was ac- accepted by God, as this was the best and the first that he had produced, and he had done in faith that God would provide more, and this was accepted by God. So back to the portion. God also mentions that if a person could not afford to bring a perfect animal, they could bring one of the required birds, like the turtle doves or the pigeons, or if they couldn't afford to provide that, they could bring grain or flour. God requires the sacrifice that is of equal value to each person. He does not discriminate based on rich or poor because the sacrifice for each person is still the same because it's more spiritual than physical. Whether rich or poor, the sacrifice is really the same, regardless of, uh, regardless of wealth. This reminds me of the story of the widow in Yeshua's time who put two copper coins in as her tithe. Yeshua recognized that this was all that she had given, that all that she could give, and was truly a greater sacrifice than the rich people who had plenty left to spare. Her sacrifice was proportionate to her wealth, but her faith in God was greater as she knew God would provide more for her. The important part of the sacrifice is the faith, not necessarily the physical thing being given. The Havterah for this portion is Isaiah 43, verse 21, through chapter 44, verse 23. It begins with Isaiah rebuking Israel, who at the time seemed to have abandoned those temple sacrifices and practices uh, from the Torah. Some have even turned toward idolatry. Isaiah rebukes Israel and reminds them of the futility of idols and the significance of the sacrifices that God instructed in Leviticus. The more they stray towards idols, the lesser their faith, their faith is in God, and idols do not provide atonement for sins, or prank, frankly, provide anything for them at all. There is nothing to put the faith in. It is all a physical sacrifice. For ourselves, when we begin to stray from God and, idol, and idolize other things, we put our faith in those things and sacrifice our time for them, but there is nothing spiritual about that. The portion in Isaiah ends with a joyful reminder of God's promise of redemption and atonement of sins when Israel returns their faith to Him. It is important to have God as our priority, which we offer the best of our time and resources and put our faith into. The portion I'm chanting from today is just the first four verses of Exodus or of Leviticus. Blessings over the reading of Scripture. Okay, and now I have Scripture reading. It's Leviticus uh, chapter 26, verses 44 through 46. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, 
nor will I hate them into utter destruction and break my covenant with them, for I am Adonai their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God, I am Adonai. These are the statutes, ordinances, and laws which Adonai made between himself and B'nai Israel in Mount Sinai by Moses. Hello, I think I know the rules around here. And they have put me in charge at times of many, many things, so. But seriously, uh, this is the rule of what Michael wears. Uh, it's easy to come in costume or in a uniform instead of trying to figure out, what am I gonna wear? What am I gonna do? It's just a lot easier that way, but I'm, I don't wanna seem like I'm hiding from anybody either. But people always say, oh, did you wear your costume? I love it, I love your costume. And my costume is never about the refs. They have an impossible job. Now that everyone has a camera, and now that everyone uh, looks at their mistakes over and over again, it's really about the fans. Fans, I think, take the refs way too seriously at times. And um, I include myself in that. And it's kind of funny, but I'm one of those guys that wears the black pants and gray shirt. And that's kind of what we do. And so um, one of the things, Purim is a rule. It's part of what we read, had read just now. Um, it's the rule that God is, it's a teaching, it's a rule, it's a judgment, as it says at the end. And Purim exists in all those th three things because Purim, uh, Purim was a judgment for Israel's benefit. Purim was a law because God is always faithful to his people. And Purim, of course, is is a hukim. It's tradition, in a sense. So it kind of goes with all three of those. It kind of goes with all three of those. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the message you have for today. I will keep it short because I know kidlims are here. And I ask, Lord, that you would be the one who is exalted today in everything that takes place for what you did through your people, for what you continue to do through your people. And we just want to be honoring of your covenant, honoring of who you are in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. So today I was praying and asking what passage the Lord would have us do for Purim. And it comes right out of your responsive reading, if you still have your responsive reading. And the wording here is very strong of... I will not detest them or be disgusted or even reject them. There's, there's some very strong, flavorful Hebrew words here in the passage of how God will not treat his people. And part of the principle we see is that God brought them out of Egypt for a reason, to bring glory to his name, to bring about good things for them good things for them and so unfortunately what ends up happening because of that is there's things that get lost among the weeds where people don't live up to what God has for them and that's kind of a lot of what we find in the story of Purim also but basically I want to emphasize some things that we talk about in membership which is basically God is always faithful to Israel God has a plan and a purpose, and he's always been at work in his people. He works through his people no matter where they are. In ancient times, it was where the people were that made the difference. The God was always based on the locale. If that God was the God of the mountains or your God was the God of the river, that was the locale that the God was based on. But our God works effectively everywhere because God always has the desire to work through his people. And that's an important principle that we talk about in membership. It's an important principle that we live out in our congregation. And so all of what God's faithfulness to Israel is about is really what we look at when we see this feast. And so I want to emphasize to you that God is doing things but people just don't automatically get to the point where uh, they're in trouble, like we have in the Purim story. A lot of times we uh, don't understand the failure that comes with success. 
we get success and we're always happy and maybe we look at that success and we say wow I did some great stuff in that success but that's really not what the success was to be about the success at times was to be something that we would learn from that we would glorify God from sometimes we see our own hand brought forth the success sometimes our the blessings of abundance you know what we have now that becomes the success and that becomes the story or the th thoughts that we have in mind in each and everything that we look at and all these become eventually obstacles to people and their relationship with God and that's kind of where our story takes place that's it definitely at work during the story of Purim and we have fasting taking place in I wanted to stop and just talk about fasting for a minute because it's part of the story it's part of what God wants to talk about and I want to read this scripture to begin it's in Matthew 5 13 probably a well-known scripture to you you are the salt of the earth but if the salt has lost its saltiness wherewith where will it be salted again it is no longer good for anything but to be cast out and trampled under foot of men and a lot of people say who is Yeshua talking about when he's talking about the salt of the earth and there's a lot of ways that this can be interpreted some people say it's only talking about believers believers are the are the salt of the earth and there's some truth to that and there's also a side is Yeshua talking maybe about here about Israel because Israel seems at times to have touched every part of life every part of the world we see Israel in technology we see Israel in the arts we see Israel throughout everything in many ways it's kind of like the way salt gives flavor to food it's like this is the flavor of our world the favor of life many times it's Israel and when Israel loses its saltiness what happens it says they're cast out people don't want to deal with them anymore and then maybe they're even trampled or put in subjection to man so I, I like that maybe interpretation maybe you don't and that's okay but it's just a suggestion there could be a different meaning to what this is talking about and so when I look at that passage this is kind of some of the background I came to and I, I talk about fasting and I want to put some uh, qualifiers on it before I begin because I don't want to take anybody to take this message and think that I have a problem with David or I have a problem with any of the leadership at Yishuatzion. I don't have any problem with anybody, okay? And I'm not th saying that we need to all start fasting or anything like that. I also want to say that I don't think we're lacking things. I don't want to say that there's something lacking and that's why this message came about. This message came about because Michael felt that he wanted to go deeper in his prayer life with the Lord and Michael said I want more of you Lord and that's one of the things that happened to me during the week of prayer and I hope it things happen to you during the week of prayer because I think that's really what it's ultimately to get at is what does it do with you what does it do with you and so I want to qualify that and I want to say I know that at times fasting has been used as works righteousness or maybe even at times it's been used in legalistically and I'm not here to promote any of that God does not look favorably on any kind of external uh, observance that is taken that way that does not bring any glory to anyone but the person who wants that glory who wants that glory so I wanted to make sure those things were clear before I talk about fasting so fasting it's good to just define things at times fasting is defined as the practice of abstaining abstaining from food deliberately abstaining from food for for the purpose of spiritual purposes okay and each person is to kind of determine that for themselves and I would also say if they need to with their doctor because it's not something everyone is called to do and that's okay but it's also seen as defined as a work of humility it was also seen as a discipline something we learned of how to restrain ourselves and so we see the role of fasting in the Tanakh 
We see many times it was part of the corporate life. People would call for a fast, like, and people would fast at times corporately. Maybe somebody died and they felt that that was time for a fast, or maybe someone, uh, maybe someone was urged by the prophets, as we see in the book of Joel, where they're being urged to fast because great judgment is coming. And I don't know, I don't know why uh, at times if there was more individualistic fasting. There might have been, there might have been. But we see that that was definitely at work in Yeshua's time and in the first century. And that fasting kind of became a religious work. It became a religious uh, type of duty that people wish to go forth and do. And we see that throughout the New Testament a, a lot as well. And Yeshua directs what motives we have for fasting. I'm going to read Matthew 6, verses 16 to 18. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. Now, when you fast, when you fast, don't go around looking uh, miserable like the hypocrites. They make their faces sour so that everyone will know that they are fasting. Yes, I tell you, they already have their reward. Already. And it's, it's their reward is there already. But you, when you fast, wash your face and groom yourself and so that you, no one will know you are fasting except your Father who is with you in secret. And your Father who sees what you do in secret, what is done in secret, he will reward you openly. Now, there's an important principle here within the text. In verse 16, it's talking about fasting in a collective sense, what a group of people do. And so we see that fasting was done by group, but in verses 17 and 18, it's talking about what an individual did, what an individual did. And we know that the Pharisees and the Talmudim, the disciples of John, they fasted also. It was a part of that kind of thing. Now, I like to talk about partners because in the story we had partners. And in fasting, there's partners. Fasting is most associated, of course, with prayer. But it doesn't say that in the book of Esther doesn't say that in the book of Esther. So it's important to look at some of the other partners. And, and ultimately, and I'm saying this very kindly, if you don't get anything else out of my message, I sometimes feel like I have to say this. If you don't get anything else out of my message, I hope that we would all want to cultivate a closer and deeper walk in our prayer lives. That's the first and foremost. If you don't have that, don't try to maybe go fasting yet. Okay? Get, get that first. Get to a point where you're praying regularly and finding things and finding information how to pray. That's more important than anything else. Get that first before you start jumping through other hoops. And so one of the, one of the fasting partners is prayer, but we also have fasting and mourning. Fasting and mourning, and that's kind of what is what is it that we're going to mourn? You know, that's those examples. Like I was saying, they're in Job and in Joel, and it has to do with fasting our sin, uh, mourning from from our sin. You know, Yeshua says that. Blessed are they that mourn; they will be comforted. What are they? What is he talking about? Maybe mourning from sin, mourning because our sin brings about bad things in our life that we need to repent for. Maybe it has to do also with. Um, mourning is as a type of thing that no one really likes because they've lost something. Mourning a job, mourning a, a, a marriage, mourning the loss of in your life. Nobody really likes to mourn. And nobody really likes to fast either. It's just kind of the way these things sometimes go together. Another partner of fasting is watchings. Fasting in it had the implication that you would stop eating food, and sometimes that meant also that you would maybe stop drinking water. <laughs> and it actually specifically will say that. Not only did they not eat, but they did not drink water either. And so, and I'm not saying that's maybe everybody's assignment either. These are personal things you have to decide in and of yourself. But basically, there was also watchings, and that meant you would choose to stay alert, vigilant, and watch 
and that you would actually put off your sleep maybe. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians as well. And so these were the type of partners that went with fasting. And I want to emphasize again, there's an important partner that fasting does not have. And that is the idea of atonement. You cannot fast your way and get atonement. There's no fasting that brings you to atonement. There's only one way to receive atonement, and that's through the finished work of Yeshua. And so that has to be emphasized because when you start reading in some of the, the li literature, especially within Jewish literature, they say fasting is a way to bring about your atonement. And so I don't want that to be a part. But fasting is really about learning to put yourself in subjection. And reading from what Paul says, this is 1 Corinthians 9, 27. It's that you're supposed to have mastery over your own body. And I know at times we want that. That's something everybody wants to know is how to master something, how to have mastery. Paul says it like this. I want my body, I, I work my body hard and make it my um, and make it my slave so that after pro, after proclaiming the good news to uh, to others, I myself, will not be disqualified. And so that's why Paul looks at it in terms of that. He wants to have that kind of relationship knowing that he has mastery over what his own body is and we can have that same ma mastery as well. So I talked about there was fasting during the Feast of Purim and it's Ta'anit Esther is the way it's pronounced. And this week, uh, the rabbis always do things a little differently. Usually, Ta'ani Esther, the fast of Esther, is the day before Purim. But in uh, this week, because Purim is on Sunday or Saturday night, and it's very close to Shabbat, the rabbis don't do different things. So that it's not uh, in conjunction with Shabbat. And so it was Wednesday night to Thursday night this past week, if you were interested when it was. But it's something that's interesting, that it's always kind of different. And during the story of Esther, this was one of the great calamities of the Jewish people. And some people say it's probably the greatest calamity up to date because, uh, you know, Hitler had control of one third of the Jewish nation. But the emperor, the Persian emperor in our story, he has entire control of the Jewish nation. And that's pretty big to be able to impact what was happening. And there was a spiritual battle going on, you know. Haman casting the lots was spiritual. He was looking to invoke spiritual power. And I hope you know that there's a spiritual battle going on in our lives, too. Galatians 5.17 puts it this way. For the old nature wants what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit wants what is contrary to the old nature. And these two are contrary. They oppose each other. And what that simply says is there's always that tension. And we see the tension in the story. And there's tension. It's a natural part of our life. But the question is, how do we deal with the tension? Tension is always going to be there. But how we choose to deal with the tension is really the important thing that we should learn from tension. Do we let the tension happen? Do we look to go to prayer? What do we want to do? And in our story, the people go to fast. Now, fasting is something that is being changed for man. It never was designed to change God. I'll say that again. Fasting is what changes man. It's never designed to change God. And as I said earlier, fasting can never bring about atonement. It's not that the fasting of Mordecai and Esther and all their friends made atonement and then God decided to take notice. God is always willing to take notice. We see that as early as Exodus chapter 2, where God took notice of the hurt that the people were suffering in Egypt through the, the, through the cruelty of their slave masters. And so God is ultimately at work. He wants to bring about what is good for the people. This is from Psalm 102. 
in which God talks about how he wants to favor Zion. It's from verses 12 and 13. But you, Adonai, are enthroned forever. Your renown will endure through all generations. You will arise and take pity on Zion. For the time has come to have mercy on her. The time determined has come. And so it's important that we understand that God knew that this was the time for Zion. And in many ways, we're seeing that time all over again. Just as in the story of Purim, God reversed things. Maybe you saw what I was wearing earlier. Now I've reversed kind of thing. And that's kind of to, to illustrate that God, people can impact history through prayer. People can impact history through fasting. We see that God can put, take one ruler that has been exalted and put one ruler down. Just as it says in Psalm 75. Verse 6 and 7. So, I mean, it's important that we understand that God is at work in all of these things. And we see that God blesses fasting. Specifically when we read it from Isaiah 58. Now, Isaiah 58 is a very strong passage in which God is rebuking, is rebuking the type of attitude people had with fasting. But God is also wanting to bring about blessing. In verse 8, it says this, then your, light will, then your light will burst forth like the morning. Your new skin will quickly uh, grow over your wound. Your righteousness will, your righteousness will precede you. And Adonai's glory will follow you. And I like that word follow you because it means it chases you. It chases after you like someone chasing you in like the chase movies or something. Then you will call and Adonai will answer. He will hear prayer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you will remove the yoke from among you, stop false accusation and slander. And so God, in this whole section of verses 6 through 12, God has all these blessings that happen when people start fasting. Now, I want to emphasize, it's not a works righteousness, and I don't want people to think I'm thinking that we need to start legalistically fasting. That's not what this message is about. But I just have said, so I want to go deeper in my own prayer life. I want more from God when I pray. I want to be blessed from God when I pray. And so I want to see God's benefits coming forth to everybody through that. And I think it's important that when we learn the practices of restraint, how we can in turn be joyful, how we can have happiness. The word tells us that these things are meant for our body. But at the same time, there's a bigger body of Messiah at large that will be blessed too. Because it says when one part of the body hurts, the whole body suffers. And that's even when your whole, like if you jam your finger or if you hurt your foot, your whole body is in, you know, trauma. It affects your whole body. And I can only imagine when something unseen in your body, like your endocrine system goes down or when your heart stops. All these things are what can happen if one part of your body is suffering. But in turn, when one part of the body gets exalted, all the parts rejoice and are happy with it too. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this feast. We thank you for your faithfulness to your people. I pray, Lord, that people would not take fasting too seriously. But it is something seriously that you're calling your people to do. You tell us in your word, if my people will humble themselves and pray, then I will turn my face toward them. And so, Lord, we want to see you being at work in your people. We see how much your people need help at this time, Lord. Not just Israel, but even the body of Messiah at large. 
We ask, Lord, that you would shine your favor upon them and be gracious to them, Lord. We ask that you would fill them with your spirit and that you would continue to, to be, be about to do your good work and pleasure. And Lord, most importantly, when we pray, like I said earlier, you are at work because you will supply exceedingly abundant what we can ask or think by the power that works through and in us, Lord. And we give you great honor and glory for this wonderful day. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful message. We're going to close with the ironic benediction. God commanded Moses and Aaron to put his name on the children of Israel on the children of Israel with this benediction. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ya Herod on open of a lecher, we who Yeshua Hamashiach, Sar Hashabon. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And Hag Sameach.